Are you the type of person who tends to overdo it because if one is good, 10 is better? Well, the inability to self-regulate is actually a hallmark symptom of ADHD. And if you're a parent, you likely assume that that's a learning disability that only affects school-aged boys. But the rates of middle-aged women being diagnosed with ADHD have doubled in the last few years. I was diagnosed at the age of 39. My guest today is Eric Trivers. He is the host of the hit podcast, ADHD Rewired. And we're going to do a deep dive into why having ADHD actually makes us more susceptible to addiction, especially during perimenopause and menopause. We're going to discuss how to talk to your doctor, the pros and cons of stimulant medication, and why awareness and self-compassion are the primary tools that you need to restore your sense of power. Because if you're not managing your brain, it's managing you. My name is Colleen Cashman. I'm a sober-ish recovery coach, helping high-achieving women get emotionally sober so that drinking less or not at all feels like a superpower. Join me each week for evidence-based holistic strategies to regulate your brain chemistry and nervous system and also develop a growth mindset so you can feel proud, confident, and resilient with or without a drink in your hand because it's not about the alcohol. Welcome back to the show. Today we're going to talk about ADHD And before we dive in, I just want to put my two cents in about what it means to be neurodivergent. Technically, neurodivergence is a non-medical term. It's a bit of a catch-all for describing people whose brains develop or work differently than the general population. But while diagnostic frameworks and understanding where you fall on the bell curve of normal, that is humanity, can be so helpful and empowering, it can also be very limiting. Every tool can be used for you or against you. And I think the biggest mistake that we can make is to spend too much time over identifying with the problem instead of the solution. It's in our nature as human beings to search for meaning. And so we tend to get lost asking why. Why am I the way that I am? And what does that mean about me? And then we rely on other people and popular opinions to tell us who we are, which often leads us to internalize our differences as deficits, which translates into a fixed mindset. Instead of saying, well, it is what it is. I am where I am and asking, where do I want to be, and what are the skills I need to get there, we get stuck. I'll share that personally, getting an ADHD diagnosis is actually what got me unstuck. For most of my life, I've been struggling to manage my mental health issues, including eating disorders from the time I was eight, anxiety, and over drinking. I've been prescribed almost every drug you've ever seen a commercial for. And while occasionally I'd get relief for a few weeks or a few months, nothing ever lasted. And it wasn't until I had a doctor who was willing to look at the bigger picture and say, hey, I think we might be asking the wrong questions here, that I was able to look at my symptoms and see something different. For me, the ADHD diagnosis brought clarity. It was like getting glasses that actually worked. And once I was placed on a stimulant medication, my life changed. It cleared some of the chaos from my brain and allowed me to build the habits that now sustain me far more than the medication does. After 12 years, I can go long stretches of time without the medication, but it's really nice to know that I have that as a tool when I get in the weeds. And that's what I'm all about these days, tools. If I've learned anything in 50 years, it's that the strategy that got you here will not get you there. And I sincerely believe the most powerful tool is curiosity. The solution to about any problem that you have time to think about is to ask a different question, to zoom out to a broader perspective, to try on new ideas and to ask what else could be true. What could change for you if you truly believed that the only thing standing in your way from getting everything you want in life is a lack of tools. And that's why I love the topic of ADHD. I don't over identify with the diagnosis, but I sure do like the toolkit because it's all about the brain 
And understanding how the brain works and knowing how to make it work for you instead of against you is a superpower. And whether you qualify as neurodivergent or not, if you're listening to this podcast, you understand what it feels like to have your brain working against you. And my passion in life is to bring you content and topics that expose you to new ideas that will restore your power by teaching you how to manage your brain. This is the real work that I do as a coach. You know, my group program, which is called The Next Chapter, the outcome of that program has nothing to do with alcohol. While most of my clients do reduce their alcohol consumption by, on average, 80% within the first month, that's really just the side effect of learning how to manage your brain and your thoughts and your emotions. I teach the tools that allow you to become unfuckwithable so that instead of wasting your life, maintaining the status quo, or just cleaning up from yesterday's bad decisions, you're focused on reverse engineering your own happiness and taking actions every day that move you forward because you have a clear sense of where it is you wanna go. And so if you're feeling stuck and you're ready to get out of your own way, pause this episode and get into the show notes and book a discovery call with me. My program is intense and it's not a good fit for everybody. You know, if you're looking for a sobriety program, this ain't it. But if you're even curious about what it would be like to work with a coach, pull your big girl panties up and find out. No matter what, you're going to walk away from the call with a bridge, a bridge between point A and point B. You'll have a clear understanding of where you're at and why you're struggling and where you want to be and what tools you're going to need to get there. I promise it's worth your time. Okay, so that's all for me. Let's go ahead and dive into the interview with Eric Trivers. Eric, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. I'm excited to have this conversation because I am just kind of delving into my own ADHD and I, it's more of an adult onset. And so I know a lot of my listeners are interested in this topic and how it affects them from maybe an addiction standpoint, also their whole entire lives. You know, I look at my alcohol use often and see that I was trying to cope the best I could. You know, alcohol is not the best tool for that. But when I look at what I've learned since I broke my addiction and uh, learned how to heal my brain and actually work with the brain I have, life has been so much better. So I'm excited about you coming on our show. Can you introduce yourself to the audience? Tell us who you are, what you do, and maybe how you came to do it. Sure. So my name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a certified clinical ADHD service provider. I work as an ADHD coach. I, I facilitate an intensive group coach coaching groups, a couple of membership communities. And so part, so I came to do what I do now. Um, I used to have a clinical practice where I was uh, focusing on autism and ADHD. And then my son was born. And then by the time he was two, he was diagnosed with autism. And then I decided to focus just on the ADHD because it was kind of hitting too close to home in the therapy room. And so I was, my own emotions were kind of coming up. So I made that intentional decision to really shift and focus completely on doing the, my stuff with ADHD Rewired. So I've been doing this podcast for uh, about a decade. And then, as I said, these coaching groups, so that's kind of been my focus. And part of why I got into specializing in this is I also have ADHD. I, you know, so about, give you a little bit of my story when, you know, going through school, lots of ups and downs, you know, I always had this feeling of, I don't think I'm stupid, but my grades didn't always reflect that feeling. And after my, so my freshman year of college, I, my, my first semester, I got a 2.2 GPA, which wasn't awful considering I was opening more beers than books. <laughs> Second Fair enough, me too. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was living it up. Second semester with a threat of my parents, of, if you don't get your grades up, you are coming home. We're not spending this kind of money to, for you to get grades like that. Okay. So I, I found the library and actually was doing a lot. I was spending lots of time studying. And then we had a one eight. <gasps> mm -hmm. Okay, so you were trying, I was trying, and then actually started doing worse. Yes, yes. Okay, and it was during the the summer in between my freshman and sophomore year. I was having a dinner with a friend, and she was telling me that she was diagnosed with ADHD, and she was describing some of the things that she struggled with. And one of the big things that that for me was this big light bulb moment was when she was talking about how she struggled with reading. 
And the way she described it, because she would say that she would start reading something. And then when she would be reading whatever it was, it would trigger, you know, different thoughts. And now she's thinking about these different thoughts, still reading the words, but like now she has, you know, 15 tracks of different lines of thoughts going on while reading what she's supposed to be reading and have no clue what she's actually reading. And I was, to me, that was like the first time that someone described the experience I've always had with reading, right? Or it's, I don't know how people keep track of the characters or what actually happened or I'm reading it and I get to the end. I'm like, I have no idea what just happened. So to me, that was one of the, that first indicator of, I should probably get this checked out. Like, and I always knew if I was interested in something, I'm kind of golden. Like I'm good if I have interest in it. If I don't have interest in it, it is, I'd rather poke needles in my eyes and it's to get me to do something I'm not interested in is so hard. And that's part of ADHD. So I got diagnosed. I was able to convince my parents for one more chance because I didn't lose my scholarship and grant money yet. But if I get one more semester like that, then I would have. So that was sort of my like, all right, get one more chance at this. The very first week back on campus, I made an appointment with the school health center, got an evaluation. And I remember the the psychiatrist saying to me, no one ever identified you with ADHD because based on this, all this assessment we did, you're kind of off the charts, ADHD. And it's amazing that you made it this far. Wow. So the way you're speaking of ADHD is how I grew up thinking of it. Although I'm old enough that I don't know that it really was a thing. You know, I think ADD was just starting to become something we, we used kind of in normal culture, but How has your awareness of ADHD grown beyond just a learning disability? Because I know for me personally, I would have never thought that I had ADHD because I can read. It's my job. I'm a speed reader. I don't know that I can read things I don't care about, but if I like it, I never had any trouble in school. I never identified as somebody with a learning disability. So can you broaden the context a little bit out of ADHD? HD as a learning disability into more of a context that may apply more to adults. Yeah. And, you know, it's depending on who you ask. I don't necessarily look at it as a learning disability, but more of a processing and executive function processing difference. Um, the core components of ADHD, and it's really, it is a horrible name for what it is because it's not even a, a deficit in attention. It's a difficulty with regulating attention and the right attention on the right thing for the right amount of time. But that's only just part of it. So you have these different clusters. So you have a presentation that's referred to as the hyperactive slash impulsive presentation of ADHD. And that includes six features of hyperactivity, three of impulsivity. You also have the inattentive presentation of ADHD. And that's more of the, you know, the disorganization, the time management issues, the you know, not, you know, not being great at like detail work, you know, having a hard time just like getting started on stuff. So those executive functions, right? So you can have for kids, six out of nine of either hyperactivity and impulsivity for, or the uh, six out of nine of the inattentiveness for adults. And this is a, a change that occurred over the last couple of years. It is now five out of nine because ADHD is a developmental disorder, Right. So Mm -hmm. we're always sort of catching up to our same age peers, but we're also always behind our same age peers, which, you know, in, which is a good thing because it, what was happening is there were a lot of people who weren't getting caught because, you know, for a lot of adults, like the symptoms can decrease in the, you know, I always tell when I used to work with kids, I say right now it's hard, but it does get easier as an adult because you get more choices about the things you want to do and don't want to do being a, you know, one of the, the sad sort of states of affair of, of education is when you have a neurodivergent brain that part of getting through school is the ability to master the boring, which is so yeah. sad because yeah. like learning is, it can actually be fun and, and interesting, but there's so much stuff that like we in our school systems that we just have to do because we have to do it. And it doesn't work for the ADHD brain. Yeah. Is there such a thing as adult onset ADHD, like I honestly can't look back at my own childhood and really recognize symptoms of ADHD. I haven't done a real deep dive with a shovel or anything, but I feel like mine kind of came on, you know, maybe hormonally, maybe just my own habits, my own lifestyle 
created this way that my brain functioned, both good and bad. I mean, it's, I don't think that my brain is bad now that I know how to use it. Yeah. So the idea of adult onset, like it's, again, it's not a black and white issue. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the, a lot of the literature, say no, but we also know that, you know, especially in women actually are the, you know, in their forties and fifties are the highest rate of diagnosed people right now, because it's, let's say they maybe had four of those nine symptoms and we're doing okay. And then menopause comes and the hormones decide to just wreak havoc on the brain. Right. And yeah. so it can push you over the edge to that diagnosis. The other, you know, the, where there is uh, sort of late onset can also be if there's like a, a head trauma or something like that. Yeah. I also feel, and please correct me where you disagree. I would love to dive deeper into this, but I also feel like some of this is a product of smartphones and our environment. Like I look at my 19 year old daughter now, we had a deep conversation yesterday about some of her experiences of feeling dissociated and distracted. And so much of it is she has grown up with a smartphone in her bed. I tried. I really tried to take it away. <laughs> you know, I tried to parent through this. But I also have friends that are my age who have, you know, you joke at a party and you don't know what you're talking about. Lay people were like, she has a raging case of ADHD. And her the focus is split. And, you know, maybe there's medications that are on board. But it seems like the behavior is creating the brain change more so or as much as the brain operating, you know, the organic brain chemistry or whatever it is, is creating the behavior, which comes first. So our environment absolutely does impact the impairment of ADHD symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, I don't think there's anyone else going to argue that we're the society we live in now with all the technology, it's not great for our brains. There's mm -hmm. too much switching. I mean, I, I once saw something that said like the average frame on a TV show in the 80s was like between seven to 13 seconds. Yeah. Now it's like about two seconds. That's got to have an impact. That being said, that does not create ADHD. Okay. It is, you know, it, does it make us more distractible? Yes. Does it make it where we're like, we have less tolerance for being bored? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that, you know... The thing that's tricky about ADHD is that we can all, I think every human being on this planet can relate to, to some of the, the features of ADHD. You know, mm -hmm. it's like we all get distracted sometimes. We all procrastinate sometimes. We all maybe say things we maybe shouldn't say sometimes, lose things. All that's like sometimes. That's the human condition. The thing is with ADHD, this is not a sometimes disorder, right? Like okay. This is the stuff that happens throughout our life it, and it is impairing. Right. It has to cause impairment or it's not a disorder. Right. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's the, we look at things like high rates of STDs or early pregnancy or addiction or arrests. I mean, you know, look at, you know, the prison population. Like that's, that, that is a population of undiagnosed ADHD that never got addressed. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, before we keep move on, I have so many things I want to ask you. Can you speak to the impairment? I mean, you mentioned it's a processing disorder, but what is actually the, what's going on? Yeah. So ADHD really is a disorder of executive functions. So okay. executive functions are those cognitive domains that, that are involved planning, organizing, task initiation, uh, emotional self-regulation, uh, sequencing, mental flexibility. Um, and so every time we have to do something that involves one of these uh, sort of cognitive uh, demands, it actually drains our executive function. And we all have executive functions, every human being, right? And the more we use them, the the more tired we get, right? Um, I'm trying to remember who who said this, but the idea that, you know, willpower is not a will call, right? Like willpower <laughs> is an executive function. You know what I mean? It's not a character yeah. trait, right? Like. You can know something is important, but if you don't have the available executive function resource, it doesn't matter how important it is if you're not yeah. there, if, if you're tired, if you're stressed, if there's just too much going on in life. Like those are the things that can really uh, create a lot of impairment. So it's, you know, part of managing ADHD also involves really setting up our environment so we're not having to, to tax our executive functions 
as much. Like one of the things that I do, like for, I have the same breakfast and lunch like every day because it allows me to not have to use my executive functions. I already know what I'm making. I have a routine around it. Like it works Uh for me. Okay. If something, an unexpected change in my plans comes up, like intellectually, I know that how hard that feels for me is outsized for the actual situation, but that's Uh executive function impairment. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what I love that you said is you've become aware that your feelings are outsized of the actual situation. And so this is a feeling problem, not a logistical issue in the real world. And so it allows you perhaps to problem solve differently. Yeah. You know, and I think that the the self-awareness piece is so important when you have ADHD because one of the things that the ADHD sort of community is just has been drowning in is shame, right? Because there's so much sort of self-judgment and judgment from others. And part of it is because we're not understanding, you know, the brain that you have, right? Like my diagnosis before my actual diagnosis was lazy. That's what I was called, was lazy, right? Which is couldn't be further from the truth. And we have the brain scans to show it. So if we look at, at functional MRI scans of group of, of groups of people with ADHD, so we can't diagnose on an individual basis, but we can see differences when you look at group studies of of these brain scans. And what you see in these brain scans, if you have somebody with ADHD doing a basic cognitive type task, kind of boring, it it, more the brain is lighting up and they're having to use sort of emotional resources. And so they're using less efficient pathways to get that same task done. So looking at what is actually required of us to do something, our brain is working harder. So I always say, when I'm looking at these images and we have the ADHD versus non-ADHD brain, we say, if we say that effort means, or the more you light up equals effort, which is the Mm -hmm. lazy brain? And it's the neurotypical brain is the lazy one. They got that cognitive, like they got to return a call, no problem. Someone with ADHD returning a call, oh God, what else do I have going on? It's like this dread because it's, you know, because part of it, we don't know what's going to, happen and we don't know how long it's going to take and what you know what we're going to need to do and so that can also be really challenging that sounds like an amazing mindset shift similar like a very simple example like i always give myself double credit if i go to the gym and do half a workout because that one was harder than the day i get up feeling like a rock star and i'll just run a couple extra miles and you know oh try this machine the day that it's harder and i can only do half as much i actually reward myself you know pats on the back and stuff oh. more and so it sounds like some of that there's mindset shifts that you can make that help you run your brain. Yeah. And, you know, and the the idea of in in my coaching groups, we do spend a lot of time talking about like self-compassion and people like, give me the skills, give me the skills, give me the skills. And yet they're beating themselves up for not getting stuff done. And it's self-compassion is the way forward through everything, right? Because it's, if we really take a step back and, acknowledge what we're working with and how hard it actually is and that we are often working so much harder than those that that are neurotypical because there's also a ton of masking that is going on that sort of masquerading is normal pretend like we don't want to be found out right and that makes it so much harder too one of the best things that i have done for my adhd is being an adhd professional that gets to be extremely out about their adhd because now i'm not having to masquerade at all yeah And then you said something too that sort of about the days where it's, you know, you feel more proud on when it felt hard versus doing more when it was, you're feeling it. And that really speaks to one of the hallmarks of ADHD and that it's inconsistent. It is that the inconsistency of ADHD is the only thing that's consistent with ADHD. So that idea of just because we did it today doesn't mean we'll, we'll be able to do it tomorrow. Like it is, it. And that speaks to when we understand the executive functions as a resource pool. So let's say we are, you know, we're driving hard for a couple of days, working lots of stuff done. There's a really good chance that following that, that, you know, hard, very intense work focus that the next couple of days, we might not be able to get much of anything done because we've drained yeah. our executive functions and didn't give us ourselves enough of a chance to, to recharge. Yeah, that, that really resonates with me. 
And I've learned to stop beating myself up. It's kind of like the high after the party or the high after the low. It's I'm going to push and get all this stuff done and I can, but then at some point I kind of run out of gas and need to plug into my charger or something, or I just can't expect as much from myself. Yeah. And you know, and one of the, the, and again, everyone's presentation of ADHD can be a little bit different for, I know a lot of people and for myself included, when I say this in my podcast, part of my intro, that starting is the hardest part, right? Okay. And so that they, part of ADHD is sort of having this like faulty on off switch. So it's, it, it can be really hard to start, but that once you start, it can be really hard to stop. And that has to do with that regulation of our yeah. intention, right? Well, what you're speaking to is almost verbatim what many of us with alcohol use disorder describe it as our off switch is broken. Do you have any insight to how someone might be experiencing ADHD and alcohol becomes a symptom? You know, I'd really like to shed some insight with this conversation about sometimes the solution to the problem is to ask a different question and asking, why am I drinking so much? What is wrong with my off switch? You know, am I an alcoholic? All of these questions can actually prevent us from stepping back. So can you talk to me a little bit about what you see an adult who is undiagnosed with ADHD, HD, possibly dealing with a substance use disorder of something? To say more about that. Well, we do know that compared to the, the general population, that people with ADHD have, do have higher rates of addiction. Okay. Because it's at the core, you know, a big part of what ADHD is, it is a, our brain does not regulate dopamine well. It's the dopamine hunter, right? It's always wants what the next, you know, shiny, exciting thing. If it's, when we talk about if it's interesting, we're into it. If it feels good, we're into it. And if it's interesting and it feels good, as an ADHDer, yeah. we typically then want more of the stuff that's yeah. interesting and feels good. If one is good, 20 is better. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Until it's not. And so yeah. one of the things that I think is really, I think if your listeners get anything from this conversation, if listeners are struggling with addiction or um, alcohol use disorder, and they're afraid, and, and maybe they know they have ADHD or they suspect they have ADHD, but they don't really want to pursue it because they're like, oh, but it's stimulant medication. I heard those are addictive. It is so important that someone who, who legit has ADHD and a substance use disorder gets on medication if they can tolerate it. Because we know that even though the prevalence of drinking and drug use is higher, when you take ADHD medication as prescribed and followed by a doctor that knows what the hell they're doing. That's also a challenge in the ADHD community. There's a lot of doctors that don't know what they're talking about with ADHD. Mm -hmm. It lowers that risk factor significantly. It is still higher than the normal population with medication, but it's, it lowers that risk factor really significantly. One of the big challenges is lots of doctors who are afraid to prescribe these stimulant medications, right? They'll say, oh, if you have a history of addiction, we're not going to prescribe you a stimulant. How about we look at what the science says and the science has prescribed the stimulant and follow this person closely? Yes. Make if, if, if they're recently sober, um, regular like uh, urine screenings to see, are they actually taking the medication uh, the way they're supposed to be taking it? Um, yeah, I, I think that's such an important piece to understand about medication and how we sort of treat this. I have a feeling that I kind of went tangentially on your question. Could you remind me of no. your question? <laughs> So, no, you're doing great. I, my own experience was I had been treated for absolutely every single other, let's go mental health disorder, depression, anxiety. I think I, every commercial that you've ever seen for a drug, I had tried that. And especially and with women, that's so right. common. And it's all hormone issues and mental health issues. I mean, I've taken them all. And, you know, sometimes a drug would help for a little bit and then I get back off of it. It's so funny that there's a stigma with ADHD medicines and not, you know, I had a pill bag bigger than my grandma's and I'm 32 years old. But when I finally had a doctor who asked a different question and looked at my chart, now she didn't know I was drinking, but I also, to be fair, would go in and out of periods, you know, where drinking was not problematic. So I never really brought that up. Nobody asked. But when I finally was, she diagnosed me and then said, 
because I went to her for another antidepressant. It was either that or my husband said, we're getting a divorce, like go get some new meds or we're done. So I went in and she prescribed load. We eventually landed on Adderall. That wasn't, of course, it's often a process of figuring out what works, Mm -hmm. but that was a game changer for me. It was like somebody gave me a pair of glasses and I could see. You know, for for me, Kelly, when when I first took Adderall, that's what I was prescribed in college. It, you know that opening scene to The Simpsons where the clouds clear? Yes. That's what it was like. And I was like, I've been in clouds this, my entire life. Like, yeah. And I still remember that moment of first time taking medication. And I was my, my sophomore year and I was I was a social work major, sociology minor, so I had a lot of reading. And I was reading this book called Crested Kimono. And the only reason it's relevant is because I remembered that. Uh-huh. And it was the first time that I read a chapter of a book in my life. I was 19 years old. The yeah. first time. I got to the end of the chapter and I knew what I had just read. And it was like, I mean, this was 25 years ago and I still get goosebumps and choked up like telling the story because it was like, I'm not dumb. It's like my, the issue was, you know, like the, the, you look at C-SPAN and all like the ticker tape scrolling at different speeds and different, that's what my brain was like on a regular, like every day. Yeah. The dashboard on my brain has Uh got tickers all over and flags and And uh, emojis and blah, blah, blah. And the medication took all that away. Oh, I'm, my brain is focusing on the book that I'm reading right now. Now the meds don't, it's not a panacea. It's, yeah. but it is the biggest chunk of what was referred to as a multimodal treatment for ADHD and medication is a, will cover about 40 to almost 70% of symptoms, but that still leaves, you know, the 70, 40 to 70% of things that still need to be addressed. And I'd love to dive into that. You know, I was going to say that for me, medication was a first step. I'm not going to say the first step because I don't do beginnings and ends. I'm on a journey here, but that medication was a turning point for me. But, you know, it, it was a first step and it's an important tool, but it's also the bridge to all the other tools. Mm -hmm. You know, it allows you to get the focus so you can do the learning, but then what do we have to learn? What comes next? Yeah. Cause there's a saying that pills don't teach skills, but they can help you learn them. Yeah. So, so what's next is sort of taking that inventory of like, all right, where am I being challenged in life? What are the things that feel just annoyingly hard when we think about, you know, like for me, like I've mentioned before making phone calls, right? Like making a phone call. If my EF is not like pretty full, that can feel like such a daunting task. So it's one that self-awareness piece is huge. Right. And then it's, you know, incrementally building those skills. But the problem too with ADHD is that it's not a skill deficit. It's Mm -hmm. a performance deficit. And so sometimes one of the biggest challenges when you, for people with ADHD, especially those who like ADHD then becomes their like area of hyper-focus and they're reading everything, listening to every podcast, listening to every audio book, and they are experts. And Mm -hmm. they're so frustrated because they still can't get themselves to do the things that they know how to do them. And so well, we understand ADHD as a performance disorder. It's okay. You know, looking at it is it's the disorder of good intentions, right? Mm-hmm. So it's looking at how do we, you know, developing the basic skills of planning, right? Like I remember the first, like growing up and whenever my teachers were like, do you use a planner? I remember not even understanding how to verbalize this, but I did not understand how planners worked. Do you write the thing on the day that it was assigned or the day that it was do or do you should you put it in your calendar if you're just working on it i literally had no clue how a planner worked I, it wasn't until college where i had to figure this out that i started kind of dissecting time management stuff and again and part of why i kind of became an expert in planning and time management and productivity skills was because i knew that i knew i had big dreams and things i wanted to do and i knew if i didn't figure out how to plan and manage my time none of that was going to happen so one of the concepts that most people with ADHD relate to is this idea of time blindness. That mm-hmm. like, how long does this thing take? I don't know. It's five more minutes. One of the biggest lies I tell myself and still sometimes believe is that this thing will just take me five more minutes. Like yeah. nothing ever takes me five minutes. So one of the things that in my coaching groups that we do is we do this throughout the 10 weeks because it's boring, but we have people check in on it weekly 
is time tracking, you but using time prediction. So not just like tracking what you're doing, but actually make that guess how long you think this task will take you. And starting with our routines, because those are the knowables. You know, like we're gonna maybe we shower every day, we make certain meals every day. So first, begin with the things that we know and and predict how long it takes you, and then actually track it. And the more you're off, celebrate it because now you're building wisdom. It's no wonder why I'm always like, I thought it took me 10 minutes to shower, make my breakfast, have coffee, get my kids out to school. Of course, that makes sense. Now I'm late because it actually takes two hours, right? And so doing that and repeating those sort of time things can be really helpful because if you want to get into actual planning and using a calendar, you have to have one, have an idea about how long things take, but two, have an idea about how, you know, there's, there's beer goggles and then there's ADHD mm -hmm. goggles. And you have to okay. make that adjustment. I, the way I sort of think about it, it's like maybe if you're playing a, a sport outdoors and you have to factor in wind, right? So if you know that you tend to, you know, underestimate things by a factor of like times two or times three, then when you're planning for it, listen to what your gut tells you and then apply wisdom. So for me, I know things typically take me three times longer than what I feel they will take. And I go through this whole process of, Okay, I, I'm pretty sure this will take me about an hour. Could it take me two hours? Maybe, but probably not. Could it take me three hours? No, there's, there's no way it'll take me three hours. I will then block three hours for that. I, I get to the point where I listen to what I'm feeling about the task. When I get to the, no, it won't take me that long, that's typically how long it will take me. Okay. And so we have to be able to let go of all the judgment in, involved in that and just say, you know what? I have learned through tracking and a lot of experimentation that I usually underestimate how long things take. You know, some people with ADHD are, who are big procrastinators tend to overestimate how long things take. I, I had someone recently in one of my coaching groups who goes, I didn't realize that it doesn't take an hour to ch clean the kitty litter and it doesn't take an hour to do a couple of dishes. And now that I know how long these things take, like they are such not big deal things anymore to me. And so okay. it's building that, that, knowledge and that wisdom of how we perceive time because we tend to be pretty awful at predicting how long things take without actual trial and error and really gaining that wisdom the other thing is learning how to use that calendar and then not over scheduling right i have a so ideally we want to have a at least 30 percent of our work day unscheduled it's not free time it's unscheduled because it is spillover time, or I like to call it, I don't know how, what, if your audience likes crude jokes, but sure. so I call it shart space. And so we all know what a shart is, you know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. We, we didn't mean for it to happen. It was kind of a surprise, <laughs> now, right? It's, oh God. Shart space is an acronym for shit happens adjustment recovery time. Nice. Right. So we need to plan short space in our calendar, right? Because we don't know what's going to take longer. We don't know what emergency we're going to have to deal with that's going to throw our day off. But we can pretty reliably know that there's going to be certain things that throw our day off. If mm -hmm. we protect some of that time in our calendar and really look at that as sort of this contingency time, right? I, I planned an hour to, to you know, make this update on my website. Okay. And I want, but I have all these other meetings today. If I don't have that, you know, some cushion time in there, there's a good chance that I'm not going to actually get to that. Yeah. So I'm going to give you an example with me where I've been learning this. I love to say that it takes me an hour to process my podcast, okay. record the intro, write the email. And at the end of every single week, I'm beating myself up because I haven't gotten a lot of things done. I got the podcast done because that's, you know, most weeks that's like the thing that, you know, I'm, I, I love to do and I get that done and that's my project. And I beat myself up because I don't get to other things and week after week, I'm not making progress in other areas. And so finally somebody introduced the concept of time blocking or something. And I'm like, that's fine. You know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to block out like Mondays between eight and 10. I'm going to do my podcast. And then I'm still sitting there at 3 p.m. on Monday going, oh, my God. And then I'm doing two a week. So it's taking all of this time. 
but I have trouble blocking out because sometimes it, I can get it done. Like I think maybe one time I did it in an hour. And so then uh, that's what I thought. But then I also can't seem to produce creatively on demand just because it's Monday and it's 10 AM and my calendar says I'm doing my podcast does not mean I feel like writing that fucking email or sometimes I'll try, but it's like I'm constipated and it won't come out. So do you have any thoughts about all of that? Yeah. What time do you do your planning? What time do I do my planning? Mm-hmm. I don't think I can answer that question. <laughs> I don't know. Well, cause like so, I, I just decided to try it. So you said that you do this time around three o'clock is when you were trying to work on it. Is that? It, I was still working on it at three o'clock. Okay. Like I had started it at eight and realized, oh my God, this is took, taking me the whole day. That's why I never get anything done. Okay. How much is perfectionism showing up for you? I definitely think that's an issue. Okay. I, I definitely think that's an issue. It's just sometimes then I'm like, it's worth it to me to make it better, to, to, to spend more time. So it, time is a weird thing for me. It, it is an abstract concept that is hard to kind of uh, wrap our head around. Okay. So it has, you have been able to do it in an hour, but it, yeah. And I'd like to be able to do it in an hour. Okay. If I'm on and I'm going, that that's how much time it should take. I do not think as a businesswoman spending five hours writing an email and show notes is really a good investment of my time. So how about that? It okay. should take an hour. Are you using AI to help you with any of this stuff? I've tried. They don't do a good job. So perfectionism might be in play here. <laughs> okay. And so one of the things I would encourage you to do is learn how to prompt AI better. Because that's a part of it is you can give it feedback and it will get better and improve on that. Okay. What else do you do? So you said it sometimes takes you five hours. How much of that time is? Or more. Or okay, that sounds frustrating. It's un because it's unpredictable. Okay. It's How long have you been doing the podcast? Investment of time. A year and a half. Okay. I mean, I just published episode 112. That's awesome. It's on my first day. Okay. Do you have a process like document or a checklist that you go through? Nope. Okay. So, I mean, I can tell you what I do, but there's no checklist involved. All right. So if we look at sequencing as an yes. executive function, you are yes. taxing your brain more, even though you know yes. the steps, because you have to reach into your brain and you're all right, I, now I'm doing this. All right. What is next? Like it, it hurts. Yeah. Like my, it, I feel like it's my brain fan. Come on. You know, like when your computer gets too hot, my brain gets too hot and there's an audible sound in my head that is my brain fan. And it's overheating and yet I'm not done and there's nothing I can do. And I just push through. It's there's, amazing. There's a, this psychologist out of Yale, Dr. Thomas Brown, and he had this, this saying, it says ADHD is like erectile dysfunction of the mind. No matter yes. how bad you want to get it up, sometimes you just can't. Yes. 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 So I can't predict that. You know, I do know to stop working. I have learned to cut my losses you know, if something isn't coming, then like sitting there trying to poop isn't going to help. Just get up and go walk it off. And then it'll come to me in another way. Do you ever try? So I find it hard to do blocking because my brain works so whenever the fuck it wants to and not like according to what my calendar says. So yeah. I tried it for a couple of weeks, but I haven't gone back to it. You know, a calendar is there to serve us. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think some of the th times what happens is we block, do time blocking and we see these things on our calendar and we're like, oh, I didn't get through to that time. I failed. It's like, so part of ADHD is an impairment and it's called working memory. Our ability to sort of hold on to a little bit of information at once and then use it and recall it or perspective memory that like, oh, I, when I leave you know, the office, I got to stop at the store, right? Like we are not great with those two uh, types of memories. Okay. So our calendar is just a tool for our memory that is organized by time. That's all it is. Okay. And so we put the stuff that we want to get done on a day. So let's say we have two or three different activities that we time blocked. And let's say we've time blocked from eight to 10, we're going to work on the podcast. And you sit down at eight o'clock and you're like, I like, this is the last thing I want to do right now. But this other thing that I've scheduled for three o'clock, like I'd rather do that right now. Great. Then just move it on your calendar, like, make a swap. Okay. Right. So it gives you that it's enough structure to say, these are the things I want to get done today, but I can also use how I'm feeling to, to pick from what am I going to do right now? The other thing to, to think about, and I always, 
I think it's so, sometimes a hard pill to swallow is that part of, I think, adulting means mm. being able to show up and do the things when you don't feel like doing it. Mm-hmm. And I think just recognizing that's a, an emotional self-regulation piece is yeah. doing the thing that we don't want to do in that moment. Yeah. So for myself, one of the things I like will try to sort of coach myself through is asking myself questions like, all right, what will my future self want me to do? Yeah. Like, that's how will my, how will my tomorrow self what want, want me to do right now? What will my five o'clock self, what will they want yeah. me to do right now? Right? Yeah. Because, yeah, it's like later seems better. You can also apply the idea of engineered urgency. So if you know when it needs to get done, can, you know, create time that's near the last minute, but not mm-hmm. the actual last minute. So mm-hmm. I don't have all this extra time to work on it. And I've done that by design because yeah. I find that when we can engineer urgency that way, it like all the nice to haves that aren't yeah. actually necessary don't even show up on the radar. We're just doing what needs to get done. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely need to re-engineer more urgency. If you give me 20 hours, I will use them. If you give me 30 minutes, I will knock it out. And I don't know there's a big difference in quality. It's a, isn't that amazing? It's, yeah. you know, especially when we're looking at sort of perfectionism. I, I One of the things I, I look at is let's take a, a time, effort, and sort of quality sort of chart, right? So if one hour of time and effort gives you, say, 85% quality. And 10 hours of effort gives you 90 to 95% quality. Do the hour. Because nobody yeah. is expecting the 95% quality. And yeah. because we tend to be the harshest critics of our own stuff, we might need to realize that what we feel is like 50% quality yeah. is actually mm-hmm. that 85% quality, which is high quality. Yeah. Yeah. So this is all good stuff. You know, I went to listen to your podcast before I came on your show and then again before this, and I found myself listening to more episodes because your podcast is really helpful. Can you talk about how, what your podcast is and also maybe your coaching programs and how you help people, you know, your average adult person who's just realizing like, I need some tools here? Yes. As I said, we've been podcasting for uh, 10 years now. So we have, I think we just came out this week of episode 520 something. So there's a big of a bit of a a backlog. And I interview, you know, it's a variety of people from just everyday people living with ADHD telling their story. Because I think that's so helpful to hear other people say the things that we thought we only thought. Right. Mm -hmm. But I also will interview experts and coaches and clinicians. And there's a lot of people who are both like myself. I'm a clinician and a coach, and I have ADHD. So a lot of people who, most people who are on the podcast also have ADHD. So it's, you know, it's storytelling, it's using uh, science-based information in a way that's not boring, but very conversational. You know, for each episode, I want someone to walk away with feeling seen and understood, maybe walking away with a couple strategies, and feeling the sense of hope and that they're not alone. So I think that feeling of me too is so important especially when, if we've been made to feel othered for so much of our life. You know, the average person with ADHD gets 18 negative pieces of feedback to every one positive piece of feedback. Mm-hmm. So being able to, you know, hear other people who, yeah, there's someone I used to work with who had this great phrase and said, we can and be kicking ass and be a shit show all at the same time. Like these don't need to be either or. They could be and, right? Yeah, and that's me. Yeah, and you know, it's funny too, because I'll talk to people, especially in my coaching groups, who I really try to make sure that they know that I don't have all my shit figured out. I struggle with areas of ADHD, and there are plenty of times when the ADHD wins. So this normalizing of the ADHD experience is such a helpful thing. It's, and it's one of the reasons why I stopped doing one-on-one work, because mm-hmm. you know, it's when you're working one-on-one with someone, and it might be great at the... about talking about ADHD and they may understand it and they may have it themselves. But there's something about if you're, it's in a one-on-one experience, there's sort of this feeling of they're just being nice or they're just saying that. But yeah. when you are in a group of, you know, eight, 10, 12 people who all have ADHD, who in both people who are my groups, I think I have experienced various degrees of success in life. We have people who have high levels of education, who have a lot of success in life. And yet you hear them talk about how much they feel like failures. Hmm. 
Mm. And you start to, to hear other people talk this way. Wait, they're doing this, that, and the other thing, and they feel like a failure. And then you start to realize, oh, wait a minute. I'm doing the same thing. And yeah. so when we, you know, part of why I think group is so powerful is that we get to to sort of be in this you know, it's a virtual room, so we're doing it on Zoom. And it's like having 12 mirrors reflected back, but possibly for the first time, there is no judgment being reflected back. And so we, when we can sort of lay down all that protective armor that we've been holding for so long and be vulnerable and authentic and, you know, with this experience, then we can actually work on the stuff around planning, around, you know, our to-dos and around like self-care and, you know, all these things that we we think are just skills, but aren't just skills. Like when you have ADHD, planning is emotional, right? There's a lot of emotional work that comes with planning. And, you know, people will often say, oh, I fail because I still have seven items on my to-do list uh, for the day. How many did you start with? It's like 20. It's like, wait, you did 13 things today on your to-do list? Let's talk about setting realistic expectations, right? And this is part of why I think the time tracking that we talked about before is so valuable because often we say yes to things because we do have a tendency to be people pleasers with ADHD. And because we actually have no idea how long the thing we just said yes to is going to take, and we have no idea how long the other things we've already committed to are going to take. So we say yes. And then we are so overwhelmed, right? And once we get a better idea of how long things actually take, it becomes a lot less of an emotional experience to say no to things, right? It's not, I, I actually know that I don't have the time to do this. Yeah. And so that could be really helpful. So in our groups, it's intensive and part of why, so it's three days a week for 10 weeks. And we have, we pair people up into accountability teams of uh, up to four people and they meet additionally twice a week. And part of why we, I created such an intense program was I needed something like that 10 years ago and there was nothing out there yeah. that was like that. I would I was seeing a therapist at the time and I would arrive 15, 20 minutes early to my therapy appointment so I could quickly do the work that I was supposed to be doing all week, the therapy homework, right? And I'm like, and at the time I had a clinical practice and I was giving my clients, you know, the similar kinds of, of exercises. I wanted them to do the work. I wanted them to do these exercises and I could not get myself to do it because a week was too far out for me. I I was like, is there anyone that can just check in with me for five minutes just to see, Hey, did you do this thing that we talked about? Right. Yeah. And so I started, you know, looking online for something like that and there was nothing. So like a good ADHD year while I did my, I started the podcast already because I didn't know where I was going with the podcast. I, as I was recording something, I kind of impulsively just recorded, I'm thinking about doing a group and I'm going to have more information next week. And I had no idea what kind of worms I just opened. So it took me about eight weeks of announcing that I'll have more information next week until I figured out like how to actually start this thing. Yeah. And so we have now had about 1200 people go through our program. We've received an award at our uh, national conference a couple of years ago for it being an innovative program. It is the number of people who have said that it has truly changed and possibly saved their life is been so rewarding and why we keep doing this work because when we get to work with other people, a community is such an important part of this growth work. You know, we can't do this work in isolation. Like it's done in community. And when we have, when we know that ADHD is the disorder of good intentions, the idea of being accountable just to ourselves doesn't make sense. Like we need yeah. to have that accountability with somebody else if we want. And it has to be shame-free accountability. And we talk a lot about in my groups on how to actually do shame-free accountability that is actual accountability and not codependence, right? Because there's, okay. I often will see people trying accountability and what they're actually doing is creating codependence, right? It's, if someone says, hey, will you call me and remind me to do that thing? That's codependence. If I say, hey, I want to do this thing. I'm going to tell you at this day and this time that I've done it. If you don't hear from me about this, if I don't check in with you at this time, could you follow up with me? That's the accountability that we're talking about. So it'd be the Oh my God. Amazing. The power. That's such a power. Yeah. Because we give other people our power. I love that idea. I'm going to do the thing. Yeah. It's almost like a boundary issue too. Like boundaries say what I'm going to do. I can make a request of you, but the boundary is what I'm going to do either way. Yes. And I love that. And the other piece is 
when you, you ask for accountability, you don't have to do the thing. The idea is, but you do need to be able to report back as to, so maybe you made an intentional decision that you realized, like you thought this was a higher priority. And as you started getting into your work, you realize, oh, I actually need to do this other thing. And shifting was the right thing. Yeah. So it's just being able to, you know, report back or account for what you did or didn't do. Yeah. That's it. I think the biggest piece of what you're talking about and the, in the bigger context of group and just community is to get out of our heads. You know, I often say our bullshit detectors are in our ears. You don't even know you're crazy until you, it comes out your mouth and goes in your ears and you're like, oh, that doesn't really sound like those, you know, we just don't listen to ourselves think. So listening to other people speak and to your point, hearing what it sounds like to be in someone else's head and realizing you're not alone, even if it's in a different context, I'm completely sold on groups too. I don't do uh, one-on-one either, except occasionally, but as a process, because I think it's exponential learning to do so and join a group. It just yeah. it, changes everything. And I learn from group members too. Like it's mm-hmm. still, I mean, I've done, I think I've clocked something like, I don't like 3000 hours of like group facilitation and I'm still learning like cool, strange off the wall strategies that I love. Like for members, like it's really this community piece and we also have this an alumni membership community because one of the guarantees I always tell everyone when they're interested in signing up is that at the end of the 10 weeks, you will still have ADHD. And in maintenance, like we're great sprinters. When something's new and novel, like we are gung ho, like we we are we can work our asses off, you know, out at this stuff. Maintenance, that's like next level shit when you have ADHD, which is why we have our alumni community. So we have ongoing support and we have a ton of peer-led sessions. One of the things that, that the model that I've created in my community is that I realized that facilitating these groups and doing this stuff is one of the best things that I do for my own ADHD because it makes me think about it all the time. And when you have ADHD, you can't do life on autopilot. You have to, mm-hmm. you got to take the reins and, and guide where you want to go. With that idea, we've had a lot of our, our alumni who are now facilitating peer-based sessions on various things from you know, doing yearly planning to just doing creative work. We have a, a session called Create With Me once a week where it's a three-hour session where people are literally just, you know, they always talk about all the creative work and stuff they want to do. They want to paint. They want to play an instrument. They want to do this, but they're never getting around to it. Have accountability to do it together. And now people are expecting you to come back because you've created this accountability of showing up. And so people are now doing things that they've been wanting to do for years and years. I've had people at the end of our groups say, there are things that I've gotten done in these 10 weeks that I've been putting off for over a decade. And that's a fairly common thing that we hear from people in our groups. Yeah. So getting out of your head, getting into action often requires group support. Yes. Cause we, we all have what I call the IBS C the itty bitty shitty committee. And, mm-hmm. I, and I don't know if you're familiar with uh, internal family systems, like parts work. Yeah. And so I think that idea of, okay, the, the itty bitty shitty committee, it's a part of ourselves. It's trying to keep us safe. It's trying to protect us. Let's uh, just acknowledge the, you know, whatever that voice is and say, you know what? Thank you for trying to help me, but I got yeah. this. We're going to take this yeah. path instead. Yeah. Thank you very much. I will take, I will give that all the attention it deserves. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah, so true. Thank you, Eric, so much for being here. And I will put in the show notes, what, what's the name of your podcast again for it, the audience? Yep, it's ADHD Rewired and our the website, ADHDrewired.com. We're on pretty much every social platform. The podcast is everywhere. You know, we have uh, always have re- registering for our coaching groups. I don't know when this is coming out, but we do groups four times a year. We also have a, a, a virtual co-working community. All of that is on uh, our website at ADHD rewired.com. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Colleen. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. And if you appreciate this content, I would appreciate if you would help me grow the show organically by sharing the content. That might mean sharing this episode, a link and texting it to a friend or posting it on your social media. You could also leave me a review or a rating. If you're on Spotify or Apple, you can leave me a star rating, you know, one to five stars. 
and on Apple, you can leave me a review. And every time you interact with this show digitally, it tells the algorithm that I'm legit and it makes it more likely that people searching for content like this, that this show will pop up as a suggestion. And if you're still listening, you're probably one of my people and you're in agreement that this content needs to be seen by more people and by the world. People need options. People need to know that there is hope and that getting in the weeds with alcohol or any other addiction is not a life sentence or some sort of permanent problem, but actually just the opposite. It's an invitation to learn how to use your brain, to take control of your life and to really find out what your purpose is. Why are you here? Happiness comes from overcoming obstacles, not having everything perfect as you've always wanted it and ever will be. And we have to get over the stigma and shame of realizing that we haven't all got it figured out by the time we're 40 or 50 or 60, because the only way to grow from your struggle is to allow it to change you. Personally, I think there's nothing more freeing than acknowledging, I have no idea what I'm doing. Personally, I think the less we presume to know, the smarter we get. So anyway, share the show if you can, and thank you so much for being a part of my community and for listening, and I'll see you next week. I'm supposed to tell you what I'm going to be talking about next week right here at the end, Tija, but I have yet to figure it out. I have no idea, but I'll get her done. See you soon.